I'd like to welcome you to this installment of our ongoing speaker series in the Hoover Institutions Project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region, an initiative supported by the Taipei Economic and Cultural Office that promotes research, teaching, and public understanding about Taiwan and the critically important region that it inhabits. I am Glenn Tifford, a visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution, and I manage the project under the leadership of my colleague, Larry Diamond. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Professor Bert Hoffman. Professor Hoffman is the director of the East Asian Institute and professor of practice at the Lee Guan Yew School at the National University of Singapore. Before joining NUS last year, he worked with the World Bank for 27 years, 22 of which in Asia. He served as World Bank country director for China from 2014 to 2019 and the chief economist for East Asia and Pacific from 2011 to 2014. Professor Hoffman has worked at the Kiel Institute of World Economics in Germany and the OECD and has published on fiscal policy, poverty reduction, debt issues, and China's and Indonesia's recent economic history. Uh, Professor Hoffman will give a presentation, after which we will take a question and answer period. I would like to direct your attention to the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can submit questions and I will moderate the discussion. Thank you very much. And without further delay, I introduce Professor Bert Hoffman. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, it's great to see you all this early in the morning in Singapore. Um, it's uh, uh, a great pleasure to be at the uh, Hoover Institution and I thank uh, Glenn Tippert and the Taiwan, the project on Taiwan in the Indo-Pacific region for the invitation. And when, uh, when Glenn asked me, it, it was actually a couple of months back uh, to talk about uh, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on Asia and, and the future of uh, global supply chains. It was clearly at a time when a lot of fears were there, but China being the center of the global supply chains, being in such turmoil after uh, COVID and basically on lockdown uh, throughout the economy and everybody was worried about what that would mean to the economy. Well, fast forward three months and um, things are quite different, quite different. The debate has shifted. COVID is still very much a global issue at, at this point in time, uh, but, but uh, China and the rest of Asia came out relatively unscathed. Uh, I'll talk more in detail about what, what they could have done differently, but, but uh, in, in, in all, the risk of China becoming a real bottleneck for the world economy seems to be gone. There's lots of bottlenecks in the world economy and, and demand has collapsed as, as, we, as, as we know and the projections for the world economy are dire. But this bottleneck idea has almost disappeared. Uh, what's still there is how COVID played out in the ongoing trade war. Now, stitching this all together, how did Asia do? What is the impact on trade, on global value change, and how, what is the consequences for the trade war? That's quite, that's quite uh, a, a, tall, a tall order. So I have lots of slides to try and illustrate it. I know I only have about 45 minutes to talk. Forgive me if I go over a little bit, but at some point I may go quite speedily through my slides, uh, which afterwards you can find uh, on the website, I'm sure. And I'm now, so first in, first out, impact of COVID-19 on Asia and the future of global supply chains. Um, the program is broadly as this. I'll first talk a bit about Asia and the pandemic, then the economic impact and the policy response with a focus on Asia, but we'll also talk a little bit about the, uh, about the global about the global economy. And then uh, third, focus on the trade and the global value change, COVID-19 and the trade war. So Asia and the pandemic, and this is how a pandemic was made. Um, it probably started, we don't quite know, but it probably started in Wuhan on December 8th. That's where we, the projections, the backward projections say that the first the first um, infected person walked around, but it took quite a while before China reacted. And, and the timeline at the beginning, it will be uh, debated and debated again, I'm sure for many, many years, uh, but really uh, the lockdown of Wuhan on, on the 23rd of January was the first milestone. In between there was hesitation, there was suppression of information, there were issues that we're currently discussing. And if China would have moved earlier, and some projections say if China would have moved on January 1st, almost 90% of China's domestic victims would have, would have been avoided. Probably a lot of the international fallout could have been avoided as well. So those were expensive, expensive weeks that were lost. 
But afterwards, expensive weeks were lost as well by other countries. And, and you see in the timeline that, that Italy, which was one of the most exposed, which one of the most exposed um, uh, uh, regions and already had very early on uh, issues, only locked down Lombardy, uh, sorry, the nation, na nationally, on uh, a, a month, nationally, uh, um, almost a month and a half later than Wuhan, but a month later, they locked down Lombardy, the most affected, affected region. The United States, uh, 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 took quite a while to, 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 to react as well. Oregon was the first to, to, to lock down. Um, uh, and the WHO, to some extent, uh, hesitated in calling, in calling uh, the pandemic a pandemic. Uh, they did declare at the end of January, they declared it a public health emergency of international concern. And it should be clear that that is actually the, the, the term which the WHO used as the highest form of, of, uh, uh, international, uh, of, of international risk. They no longer have a term of pandemic. They just use it for PR somewhere in March to make it clear that, yes, this is very serious and everybody should take this serious. Now, four months later, five months later, June 10th, we are in total confirmed cases of 7 million and total confirmed that of 400,000. Uh, it's not yet the plague, it's definitely not yet the Spanish flu, which had 50 million victims, but it's not yet over. We're bending the curve, and this is, this is wonderful type of, the, 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 our world in data is the best website to find the data on the, on the pandemic, but they use data of, of Johns Hopkins, they use data of, of the European CDC, they use data from everywhere to illustrate where we are, but the, the, the presentation on, on our world in data is just absolutely fantastic. These are the daily confirmed deaths per million uh, on a log scale and rolling day average. And you see uh, that some countries, such as South Korea, uh, Philippines, Japan, New Zealand, and even Singapore, even though we're still here in Singapore, we still have our issues, are gradually getting out. There's some countries you don't see, or some economies you don't see, such as Taiwan, because they have none. Uh, this is no longer on the on on the slide. Vietnam never had any victim uh, in throughout the whole pandemic. Uh, Cambodia, Laos, uh, uh, Myanmar, very very low casualties. And if you look at the, the the total landscape, you can compare internationally how the uh, uh, the death rate. And again, it's a, it's a sad chart, but the deaths uh, are probably the best of all measures. There's data issues throughout the issue of pandemic, but deaths is hard. death is hard to cheat. So this is probably the best idea of where do we stand in terms of, in terms of the pandemic. There's a total confirmed deaths per million population due to COVID. And on average, if you've done the sum, on average in the world, um, the uh, 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 total amount of deaths is about 52 per million. My own country, the Netherlands, has 351 per million. It's, it's this, this, this little country right here. Uh, France is looking at 448. The United States is looking at 338. China, where it all started, is looking at three. Three deaths per million. Korea, similarly, three deaths, uh, 5.4 deaths per million. Taiwan, point three deaths per million. The whole of the, the old, what, what, what people would say, the Khmer Empire here in Southeast Asia, hardly has any death. And some speculate that this has to do with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the hemoglobin E that seems to be different in, in that part of the world compared to everybody else. And it gives protection against malaria. Maybe it gives protection of COVID. But there's a clear divide in performance, if you want, if you take deaths per million as, as performance, as many more measures, uh, between, between, if you want, the East and East Asia and the rest. But even South Asia, uh, uh, India uh, is, is still rising, but India still has, has uh, um, a 5.6 per million. So if you want, in terms of numbers, still very, very low numbers compared to a lot of the Western countries, even good performers such as such as Germany, are looking at a hundred victims per million at this point in time. Um, 
So how did it happen? Well, there's probably going to be theses written about this for the next 50 years. We're still writing about the Great Depression, and we're still writing about the Spanish flu, as a matter of fact, and we, I'm sure we'll still be writing about, about the COVID-19 pandemic 50 years from now. But this is a very nice illustration on how economists think about epidemics. And this is from Richard Baldwin, who unimaginably produced a book within a month with, with, fantastic, with fantastic contributions. It was some, done somewhere in February, uh, and it's still a standard work. And, and really, for an economist's point of view, uh, there, there's two issues. One is containing, containing the medical aspect of, of uh, 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 an epidemic and the epi curve. And the key issue is, is to bring down the curve, is to flatten the curve. Why do you need to flatten the curve? Well, you need to bring the number of new cases down to a level that your health system can manage. That's very quickly saying that, well, you have to understand the epidemic, you have to understand the virus, you have to understand how it works out on the population, you have to understand where you are in your health system, and you have to understand how you can mobilize, and how you can increase the level of, of capacity in your health system and then work on that and, 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 and take your measures to contain the disease, closing down the economy, changing people's behavior, uh, uh, stopping travel, everything that, that, that countries have done, and, and calibrate that to get your uh, 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 epi curve at the right level. Why do you need to calibrate? And here's where the economist comes in. Because the stronger you act, the more you close down the economy, the more the economic damage will be. Now, there's a bit of a debate on whether this is actually true, but Richard Baldwin, who I take as an authority, says, look, you know, if you have very strong containment policies, you have a very deep recession. If you have to close down the whole economy, basically your production goes to zero. Uh, it never happened. It never happened in any country, but a, a large part of the economy was closed, as well, especially that part of the economy that required human-to-human -human interaction was closed. Schools were closed, uh, uh, theaters were closed, travel was closed, many parts of the economy were closed. Uh, simply to avoid the to avoid the infection or to bring down, if you want, the R naught or the R zero, the how many how many people get infected by an infected people a person, and uh, you need to get R naught below one in order to force an end of the epidemic. Because if it's below one, then every every infected person gets replaced by less than one infected person, and then in the end you go to zero. But the stronger you have those containment policies, the more economic damage you do. So that's as a background on what has actually happened. But before that, you can look at the world, and this is the Global Health Security Index, a, a very credible index for very wise people that looked a couple of years back, this is 2017 numbers, about who is prepared for pandemics. And this is the world. And the yellow the yellow part of the world is the best prepared. So including my country, the Netherlands, but including also Thailand, uh, Taiwan, uh, South, uh, South Korea, uh, Singapore, uh, all well prepared, all well prepared countries. But the best prepared countries you find in Europe and the United States and Canada. Clearly, that did not necessarily work out the way we thought. Preparation is one, and it was helpful to have, but, but preparation on theory is one. Preparation in practice seems to be a lot more important. And the practice, uh, East Asia has had a lot. There was SARS, there was H1N1, there was MERS, and if you look at the list, uh, you see why countries uh, uh, such as Taiwan and Singapore and, and, and Hong Kong, Japan, and Korea, the MERS infection of 2015, they were prepared, they had their legislation in place, they had their playbooks in place, they had their strategies in place, they had their organization in place. And so when called upon, basically things ran well. China is interesting there, because China was fairly well prepared. China has their own China Center for Disease Control modeled after the United States Center for Disease Control. And after the SARS pandemic, basically the whole organization and the whole legislation was set such to prevent uh, 
a new outbreak. Why the delay? Well, in part, it was politics. The politics got in the way, uh, the dynamics around the Chinese New Year, the, uh, there were some meetings in Wuhan, uh, trivial with hindsight, but the party meetings and the, 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 the regional parliamentary meetings were in Wuhan. So people felt that, well, it, it, let's not take too strong a measure because we wouldn't be able to hold those important meetings. Big, big political mistakes, if you want, that delayed the reaction of a system that was actually well prepared. In other countries, um, 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 people didn't wait. And here is some, some illustration of how countries react in stringency of policy. And I will go through a timeline in a moment, uh, but this is from the Blavatnik School of uh, uh, Oxford University that monitors what, what type of actions countries have taken over time. And it's a fantastic database. Uh, and this is, these are two snapshots, March 1 and May 21. And you see that basically in the end, everybody ends up with very, very strict measures. But in the beginning, March 1, and I go back even earlier, uh, 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 very few countries took measures. You see here Italy that took measures. You see here Iran, you see Iraq. Uh, and of course, China and, and the rest of East Asia that, uh, that had taken measures by the time of March 1. If you go to the stringency levels and on the, on the right, you, you find the definition that has to do with school closures, workplace closures, it has to do with cancellation of, of public events, anything you can imagine to control that virus. Well, here is January 23rd. And January 23rd is, of course, the auspicious day that Wuhan was closed. Well, Taiwan was already in action, and Korea had already in action, had taken some measures uh, to, to uh, uh, at least be aware of the virus. This is, in fact, Taiwan and Singapore and Japan and Korea, they started taking actions on December 31st. December 31st was the day that uh, China reported to the WHO that something is happening in Wuhan. They don't quite know what yet, but it was an atypical, atypical pneumonia of an un unknown, of an unknown source. And that's where uh, a lot of the East Asian countries simply put in their, put in, uh, in, in, in place their, their playbook and started to take measures. I remember coming back from, from China uh, in, the, in the second week of, of January and, and temperature was taken. They tracked whether I had gone to Wuhan or not and, 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 uh, and then they let me go. It was light, but it was there. And that escalated over time. And if you look at the escalation over time, so this is 15th of February, uh, uh, more countries, more measures and more stringent measures. The stringency is the, the, level, the level that you see on the left, uh, the left vertical axis. And by 20th of March, basically, uh, uh, many, many countries around the world, but including all the East Asians. And what is striking is that actually a lot of the East Asians, yes, they take measures, but not yet to the max. I mean, the max is actually here. You don't see this, the Philippines. They simply closed down from the start. They went from zero to 100. Uh, 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 but many of the countries, they, they, if you want, played it by year. They, yes, they... they accelerated the measures, they uh, escalated the measures over time if and when needed. And, and the country I live in, Singapore, in the end had to basically go to a complete lockdown. They didn't want to, but they had forgotten one part of the population, namely their migrant labor population, which, is, which, is in the, in, um, uh, which lives in compounds together. And there was an infection and suddenly they came up with 1,000, 1,500 a day infection. Uh, and that's where Singapore indeed locks down here. But Taiwan, you see, never really got there. They never really got there. They, st they stayed at a fairly low level of, of, uh, of stringency. And as a result, they'll come out, and I'll show that in a, in, in, a, in a while, as a result, they came out economically better. Second is interesting, and, and YouGov is an organization that, that does surveys on, on many things, including on personal attitudes. Uh, they do personal attitudes around behavioral change around COVID, and I find it absolutely fascinating because it's not just the government measures that matter, it is what people do. There's research, and including research from the World Bank, my previous employer, on uh, how much did people change their behavior before measures were taken and after measures were taken to, to control the virus. And it shows that a lot of people actually automatically already start taking measures. They know that there is this virus out there, and even if the government doesn't do anything yet, 
they start doing things in their own community, they start avoiding places that might infect them. And so you see a lot of behavioral change even without, without formal action by the government. And that you see in East and West. The only real difference that you see in East compared to the West is masks. And you see from early on, everybody is wearing masks. Singapore is the exception. Singapore is the exception. Uh, they caught up very quickly, but in the beginning there was a, a constraint. They didn't have enough masks and they couldn't, for some reason, they couldn't import them. They don't have production at home, unlike Taiwan, unlike Korea that produced at home. Uh, Hong Kong could draw from, from, from China. Uh, 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 so, but as soon as they had them, everybody wears them. And now on the street, everybody wears them. Y yes, it's obligatory, but even if it's not, uh, it comes quite natural. China is quite natural because everybody uh, during winter time was wearing a mask anyway because of because of air pollution. So, so this tradition of wearing masks and and with it comes a, a, a well again it's a debated point, but uh, it seems to be an important factor in uh, in getting or not the the infection rate down and the big there's a big difference between east and west in this personal behavior a second a second difference which i find fascinating and i found it from uh, algebras which is a consultant really consultant firm that looked at the at the uh, 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 relation between uh, the the real time r not the r0 uh, as in the infection rate and the measures taken and they give different colors for different measures. So the hard lockdown is red, the soft lockdown is green, and the medium lockdown is yellow. Uh, if you look at this, it really doesn't, the, the, the level of lockdown doesn't explain very much on how rapidly, how rapidly R0 is being reduced. What does explain, and that's what you see on the x-axis, is the overall health sector robustness, is the overall country resilience that matters in, in basically addressing. So it's not just announcing the measures, but it's also getting them done. It is not just announcing that people should be tested, it's also having the test available, having the, having the free access to healthcare available, that makes it work. So in other words, working systems. Uh, a final factor that I think has been quite important is in the end trusting government. And I think there is a, quite a difference between, between the East and the West and, 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 and the seriousness with which people take their government. And that is, the, the, that, that is across autocracies and, and democracies. It's not just an autocratic factor. Of course, that plays a, a big role in China. Uh, but, but in Taiwan, in, in, uh, in, in, in Singapore, in, in Thailand, in, in a lot of countries, in Japan, there's this relatively high trust in government, basically trusting that government does the right thing and if government says something, you follow. A final cultural factor that, that, that probably plays a role is, is the sense of community, which is simply different. I have weekly Zoom calls with my family back in the Netherlands and and, and for some reason, they think it's very important. They think privacy is very important that a tracking device on your cell phone, which tells you whether you have been close to somebody who was infected, they think that that infringes on privacy. So they think that that is more important than knowing whether you have actually been close to an infected person. Uh, th these are cultural traits that, that I find hard to, to, to explain. And I've become a lot more Asian than, than Dutch, I have to say. Uh, uh, I understand very well that you need to track these things. But, but, but as I said, in the Netherlands, with 351 deaths per million, as compared to the four deaths per million in, in Singapore, uh, thinks that privacy is more important. So, so these, are, these are, if you want, political trade-offs, and they're made differently from, from around the world. But they do have an impact on how well, in the end, you're doing in, in fighting COVID. So here's some light lessons. Uh, and uh, again, this is an ongoing debate. And, and there's actually a very good publication from the Institut Montaigne, the French Institute, that looked at uh, uh, the East Asian responses to the pandemic. And, and they draw some of these lessons. I draw some of mine. But that, uh, that, that publication, Fighting COVID-19 from Institute Montaigne, is, I think, uh, one of the best reads in this area. But uh, first, and I already mentioned it, uh, past experience matters a lot. If it's fresh, if it's fresh in your blood that you had a pandemic, an epidemic, uh, uh, basically, you just, you just reactivate what you already knew. Uh, of course, 
the youth factor is quite important. The, uh, uh, the, the impact of the COVID-19 on the elderly is more important and explains some difference between East and West. In general, there's more younger societies here, but it explains only a little. I mean, Singapore is have an average age of 40, the United States is an average age of 38. So it's not, it's not that it explains everything, but it explains some. It explains the Cambodias of the world. It explains maybe why Indonesia, despite having fairly poor management, uh, their death ratio up until now is still quite, is still quite, uh, quite uh, acceptable. Uh, clear legal framework, contingency plans, be organized. It matters. Um, and moving early, moving early and taking at, at, at whatever level of, of, of stringency, but moving early, being prepared, mobilize, mobilize contingency uh, for potential escalation of the issue and scaling up when, when necessary uh, is, is, I think, a factor that, uh, that most East Asian countries have down to, to an art. Uh, clear communication. Uh, I'm, and, and I'm not just talking about the United States, but the United States was not the master in communication in this in this uh, in this round. I, I'm afraid I have to say, uh, but but China not known for its communication. And of course, again, they messed up this first month, but after that, every day there was a a, a, a press conference with real information, with the best possible information that was out there. I, I thought that was remarkable for a country such as China. Uh, here in, in Singapore, the, uh, uh, the prime minister have, has given four or five major speeches on it and followed up by, by the more technical ministers on a daily basis. Uh, Taiwan, uh, uh, President uh, Yi Sing-wen, fantastic communicator in, in the whole process. And even Carrie Lam in Hong Kong, frankly, not the most popular person, but in terms of managing the COVID outbreak did well. But even with all this, uh, 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 with all this, this preparation and, and with all this capability, you still need to have some luck. And, and I think to some extent, Taiwan and Hong Kong fall into the, into the, into the luck sector, uh, i.e. they were unlucky because Hong Kong had a lot of protests and that meant that there was no, no Chinese visitors coming. But that when COVID broke out, of course, that became a big advantage. Same with Taiwan. Uh, uh, China did not like the outcome of the presidential elections and, and had taken measures and the group travel was banned. And so there were very, was very little interaction at that point in time. Uh, uh, and that became a major advantage at the time the time that, uh, that uh, COVID broke. Uh, being far away also helps. Uh, New Zealand, they, I think they did wonderfully well, but also they're really far away. So <laughs> being in a relatively isolated place may help as well. Uh, uh, in the end, what you can learn for the future is not to be lucky, but just to be prepared. So moving on to the economic impact. And, and here comes that relationship between lockdown measures and the economy. And, and mind you, there's an interesting debate going on on the, on the uh, um, uh, uh, Spanish flu. And there's an MBR paper, you can look it up, which basically says, well, actually there is no trade-off. Uh, there is no trade-off because we looked at the numbers and, and cities that had very stringent measures back in 20, uh, 1918 did well in the medium term on growth. Be that as it may, well, there's two, there's two remarks there. One is medium term, and, and if you can sit it out for the medium term, that's okay, but some countries can't. But second is this uh, uh, growth in the medium term, because the Spanish flu was very different from COVID. COVID hits largely the old, the elderly. Uh, the Spanish flu, by and large, hit the people in the most productive years. The, the, the 20 to 40 year olds, they were the most, the, 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 most, the most affected in those days. Maybe because they moved around a lot, there was an army factor, there was many factors that, that played in that. But it was, the young, it was the young that died, not the old. That, of course, makes a huge difference for your future productivity. If your most productive generation uh, gets wiped out by the Spanish flu, then you grow less going forward. So. I'm sure it's, 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 it's true for the, for the uh, Spanish flu, and uh, this NBR paper, I'm sure, has done the numbers right. I'm far less sure for this. I think that to some extent there was a trade-off, and therefore it is important to get, to get the measures calibrated right to minimize the economic impact. And the economic impact is huge. Uh, 
And here is a summary relationship. This is done by UBS and investment bank. And uh, I forgot to mention, but the investment banks, uh, 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 sometimes, they, you know, they're, they're sometimes quick and dirty analysis, but at least they do a lot of analysis and clearly there's a lot of money at stake. So they always have interesting things to say. And this is use of UBS. They combine uh, the Oxford Restrictiveness Index together with mobility indicators taken from OpenTable and, and from, from uh, Google Mobility. And this is worldwide. This is global. So this is basically, and you see here, the ramping up of the restrictiveness, basically after mid-March to, to, to the highest possible level. It's actually, UBS calibrates the Oxford number, uh, the numbers a little bit, but, uh, but to a very, very high level. And you see an absolute collapse. You see an absolute collapse of the, of, of the reservations at restaurants. And at some point, you're not allowed to go to restaurants. But, but you see retail and recreation, transit stations, workplaces down to 40, 50, 60 percent in terms of mobility. It doesn't mean that all work stops. And right now I'm working from home like many, many of you. But it does mean that work becomes more difficult, it becomes more uh, 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 if you want this, this higher cost in doing the work, and and a lot of sectors, including including restaurants, including theaters, including a lot of entertainment, is simply no longer no longer possible. Um, here again, UBS combines uh, the growth deviation from pre-COVID and post-COVID with uh, the 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 change the change in. Um, uh, the change in mobility restrictions, and you see a very clear, a very clear negative relationship, which you expect. But you also see that those countries that don't do as much on the mobility restrictions, and this is observed mobility restriction, not not announced, not policy, but it's it's actually observed. Uh, you see that trade off that those countries that didn't have to intervene in a massive way did prospectively better in their economy. Again, it's early days and it's not yet done and we're still, uh, uh, the, the, the forecast, global forecasts are being revised every day. Uh, but overall, the world, the world uh, is, is not a good place. And there's clearly, these are the lead indicators of the OECD and across the world really. And, and then the, the blue one is consumer, the blue one on top is consumer confidence that is about to go down. It's not yet down that much. That's in part because of the measures that government have taken. But across the world, the expectations of future growth are quite down. And this is up till the end of May. Um, and both the IMF, the World Bank, and the OECD, they have brought in their projections. And we uh, uh, see a tremendous difference between pre-COVID and post-COVID. So this is the World Economic Outlook numbers from January 20th and then April 20th. And the world, the projection of the IMF for world growth goes from about plus three to minus 3.3, a six percentage point drop. The United States goes from two to minus six. Interestingly enough, uh, maybe people ignored the IMF because uh, uh, Powell said something like this overnight uh, that it might be 6% drop or 6.5% drop and the market crashed. So people didn't listen to the, to the, to the, to, to the IMF before because they said exactly the same thing. The EU even worse from, from plus one and a half to minus, to minus uh, six, seven or eight. Asia, not exempt from the misery, but still China bringing in positive growth. India projected to have positive growth. ASEAN, uh, just a, a, a minor, a minor drop. Hong Kong, big drop in part, well, because of tourism visitors, uh, that won't happen. Uh, Korea, mild drop in, in, in growth, not as big as, as many of the, of the European countries. Thailand, a bit of an exception. Uh, uh, in part because of the uh, uh, the tourist relationship with, uh, uh, with with China and in Taiwan, there's other things going on as well, not just uh, not just the uh, not just the COVID. Vietnam did very well on COVID, does very well economically. So a reversal of fortune, but less so in Asia than in the rest of the world. Um, I'm going to skip this in, in the in the interest of time, but. The, the, the message is, and 
afterwards you can look at the detail. The message is that, of course, this decline in growth has a massive impact on employment. Now, this is a simulated employment. This is not official unemployment numbers. Official unemployment numbers in, in, in most of Asia, especially China, but other countries as well, are not very useful. China only measures urban employment and, and misses out on 270 million uh, migrants. So their official unemployment rate went from 5.2 to 6.2%. Uh, probably the reality is something like 15% unemployment. But much, much more in the, in the direction of the United States. But a lot of other countries, uh, their strategy is to keep people employed, i.e. they tell employers, keep them on the books and we'll just pay their wages. And, and in this case, this time around, some countries paid up to 100% of wages uh, to keep people in their workplace. But this is a simulated, simulated uh, employment uh, numbers and they come from the ADB, with a, a complex, a complex economic model, quite a credible model, uh, and you see a very, very big impact on on employment all around, and of course, then also on wage income, which in turn leads to a demand loss going forward. So even if you, as a country, have done well in managing managing your COVID, you still get hit by demand from the outside, and therefore you need fiscal policy, and the fiscal policy have been absolutely unprecedented and I, I titled this as fiscal policy is the whole kitchen not just the, not just the sink and it is absolutely remarkable how much and this is not even everything and uh, uh, but how much fiscal deficits are increasing and the United States is probably going to end up with a 15 percent 15 percent of GDP deficit in this year advanced economies overall about 10 percent. Uh, again, uh, and I'll, uh, th th there's, there's more to this. I mean, uh, Germany has announced 20% of GDP, 15% of it goes through basically development banks and other, and other off-budget activities. Japan, the same thing. They have a 15% of GDP package, only 8% or, or something in that order is on, is on, on budget. Italy, Italy, uh, 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 there used to be a euro norm that you can't have more than a 3% deficit. Well, clearly, Italy is going to go way, way over it, but with, with, with the support of the European Union. This is very different from the global financial crisis. And those of you old enough to remember, uh, remember how difficult it was to get these support packages together. One of the key reasons for that was that the global financial crisis, at least in the popular perception, was caused by these bad banks that did bad things and now they needed a bailout. That's a pretty bad proposition. It's a very different proposition from, oh, there is an epidemic, we need to close down the economy, and for that we need to compensate people, people either through unemployment pay or through wage subsidies. Very different proposition, very different political support for the various packages out there, but still very different approaches, and the US, with huge unemployment numbers and huge increases in unemployment, it takes a very different tack from the Europeans and some of the some of the Asian countries. Here, the fiscal deficit in Asia uh, is that big and and growing. China just uh, two weeks ago, <clears throat> they've been careful. They've been very careful in announcing packages, uh, and and until two weeks ago, the deficit looked at around uh, two percentage point higher than last year. Last year was around six. Uh, now it's five percentage point more than last year. So a big fiscal stimulus coming from uh, from China as well, but a very different fiscal stimulus than in uh, 2008 after the global financial crisis. In terms of impact, China will not save the world economy simply because the way they spend it. A lot more is to social to social services. A lot more is to uh, 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 what they call new infrastructure, which will have very uh, much less international effects compared compared to the fiscal stimulus of uh, of 2008. Um, it's not just fiscal; it's also monetary. And central banks' balance sheets keep on growing. This is just one measure of of how much central banks do. And you see the Fed going from 15% to 30% of GDP in the size of its balance sheet. You see here, they were only just now winding down from the previous, the global financial crisis, and now they're raking up again, and they might end up with 45% of GDP uh, deficit. The European Central Bank, very late 
very late at the global financial crisis. They only really started in earnest in 2014. Now, uh, 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 very early on, a big push for a very big expansion of the balance sheet. And it basically means central banks buying assets of all kinds, but also the kind that the government prints, i.e. treasury. So uh, I wouldn't call this modern monetary theory, but it's, it's close. It's close to it on the right sense. You see uh, Japan already in the stratosphere and it's going even higher, Bank of England, Bank of Canada. Quite different in Asia, in part because Asia is not, is not yet at the full zero, the zero uh, uh, bound in interest rates. Um, so, so interest rate cuts uh, is one instrument. China uh, and, and uses reserve, reserve rate cuts. So banks need to hold less reserves at the central bank. It doesn't increase the balance sheet of the, of the central bank, and rather it shrinks the balance sheet of the, of the central bank, but it gives more liquidity for the economy. Uh, a, a whole range of, of central banks have uh, uh, opened up special windows for lending to small and medium enterprises. Remember, those small and medium enterprises need to be kept alive. They were, now they were closed during the, during the COVID uh, epidemic measures. Keep them alive through loose credit. And, and, and then in China and in Korea, in Indonesia, you can rediscount that credit at the central bank at favorable terms. It's basically central banks becoming, becoming policy banks. Um, so in sum, um, well, COVID-19, it means both a demand shock and a supply shock. And, and it's important because it also means that, that notion is important. It's been debated a lot in the, in the literature. It means that just a, just a normal stimulus like there was in 2008 won't do the job because if still large parts of the economy are not functioning, whether closed down by the government or because people are hesitant to go to the theater, to go to the cinema, to go to the restaurant, uh, uh, just because uh, 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 Powell reduced the interest rate of the central bank with half a percent, it doesn't mean anything. In 2008, it meant that there was more liquidity and markets would get boosted because of it. And then as a consequence, there was more consumption and the economy was open. In this case, it is different. And you cannot fully get back to normal if you don't resolve the COVID issue. So in that sense, there is no trade-off. You have to still resolve that COVID issue. Services are likely to be more impacted than manufacturing. Uh, that has consequences for international trade. And it, in, in my view, it also means that international trade is going to be less affected this time around than last time around. But that is a hypothesis that still needs to be tested. Asian countries, uh, uh, first in, first out, are relatively unaffected, relatively efficiently managed, and their economy broadly fares better. But of course, they are hit. Uh, in part because of domestic issues, but more so because of external issues, because of the lack of tourism, the lack of trade, the lack of demand from, from Western countries. Uh, and finally, uh, the economic policy response as in Asia is in general less aggressive than the OECD countries, but, but for, for Asians, if you want, quite, quite aggressive nevertheless. All right. Um, Moving to the last piece, and that is the impact on trade, uh, global value chains, and the trade war. Now, the first news seems to be not so bad. The, the Dutch, and it actually is called the Central Planning Bureau, the CPB, but they call themselves internationally the Bureau of Economic Analysis, but the Dutch word is Central Planning Bureau. They don't do central planning. But what they do do is, is do, uh, they assemble numbers on world trade. And they, the last number is from March. You have to take that into account. So you see a little bit of decline here in the fall trade volume. You see it here and you see it in the growth numbers here. And of course the value of trade uh, has gone down in part because of commodity price collapse, but it still looks quite all right. So more, minus three, four percent real, another three, four percent, three, four percent in in price. Quite different from the very sharp collapse that you see here during the global financial crisis. And you see here the growth numbers just just 
going negative 20, negative 25. And people said that this is the end of globalization. It wasn't, but it did affect globalization in the, in the medium term. Part of it is commodity prices. I won't go into it with the exception that I just, <laughs> this was the first time in my lifetime that oil prices went negative and I could not understand how that worked, but uh, now they're 50% down from, from, from compared to the uh, compared to before before COVID, uh, uh, it, it reduces the price level in overall trade. So the, therefore the value of overall trade simply collapses because of prices. That's not volume, but prices. Um, but looking beyond the first quarter, and there's a few countries, not that many countries, but a few countries, and I, I looked them up in, uh, sorry, this is CEIC data. Uh, and some even, some including China up until May. If you go beyond this first three months, you see the collapse to become much sharper. Uh, France in April, a minus 40%. Well, France got on lockdown, so their trade basically, their exports basically stopped. Uh, Japan, quite a strong decline. Germany, strong decline. Everybody basically, uh, a, a, a fairly strong decline. The Asians, again, a little bit better. Uh, Taiwan, actually, relatively okay. Uh, but even Vietnam, that did very well last year, uh, that did very well last year, um, 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 is seeing a decline in its exports value. Um, China, uh, if you want, only a 3% decline in value in, in, in May, exceptionally good. In part, that is explained by, well, what do you guess? It's medical products. The medical products have very strong growth category, uh, uh, automatic data processes, computers is another uh, strong growing and it's, these are big chunks of, of China's export basket. Uh, so, so in part, be, if you want, these, these are COVID effects. In part, they have a better trade performance because of their manufacturing capability in products that are relevant uh, for, for, for COVID at this point in time, but also because they were open. And a final word on, 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 on this, and this is, this is probably through across Asia, is that China, uh, COVID hit just before Chinese New Year, or the lockdown hit, I mean, the COVID hit sometime before, but the lockdown started just before Chinese New Year. And the first measure of government was to simply extend the Chinese New Year holiday. Now, the significance of that is that in a normal year, in the run up to Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year, companies build up their inventory. And companies that draw from Chinese producers build up their inventory from those goods that they get from China. Uh, in the expectation that China will close down for about three weeks normally. Three weeks after New Lunar New Year, you don't need to call China. This time around, that became, of course, it began double, it became almost two months, three months. Uh, but but they could in part they could they could uh, run on these increased inventories that were produced for Chinese New Year. So if you want, that was a bit of a piece of luck that helped some of world trade uh, dive less deep than it would have otherwise. Uh, nevertheless, the outlook is not good. This is the uh, 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 new export orders uh, around the world average and. Uh, below 50 is, is negative, it's been below 50 for, for a long time, but it's, uh, it's now 38 is an unprecedented number. You also see the container shipping. And if you want, you can look at indexes such as the Baltic Dry Index, which is the price for, for future shipping capacity that is also in the doldrums. And it doesn't look very, people are not very optimistic about world trade. Um, exports also is, people and tourism. So the outlook for travel is even worse. This pretty much looks like, like my schedule after January. I mean, travel disappeared. Uh, the, co the commercial commercial flights went from, from 100, the, this is an index to, to around 20, 25. It's coming up a little bit, but nothing much to speak of. Domestic traffic is a little bit better, but nevertheless, this is one of the hardest hit sectors internationally as well as domestically. Um, so what does this mean for, for global supply chains? Well, I need to step back and tell you a little bit about how global supply chains grew and, and, and how they developed in the past, uh, in the past um, uh, uh, couple of decades. And uh, in the past couple of decades, they grew very rapidly since the 1970s. This is the, uh, 
global value chain share of global trade. And you know, people make it up, but the, the measure really is any, any good that flows through at least two borders. It's a bit of a loose definition, but you have to go with something. And so this became the, the definition of, of uh, global value chain. And this is as a share of total trade. Of course, total trade expanded quite rapidly as well. Um, since the 1970s, and a couple of things happened. One, technology changed, communication technology changed. B, transport technology changed, actually, already since the 1950s to container traffic, but it took off really in the, 19, the 1970s. Uh, and uh, C, uh, 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 the politics changed. Basically, there was a large, a large amount of a large amount of reduction in tariffs. It was the Uruguay round, and it was the WTO set up. And fourth, politics changed, and that, if you want, was China. Politics, decided, China decided to rejoin the world economy. As a consequence, you see an enormous boost of the share of global value chain trade. Uh, into the overall into the overall trade, it becomes much cheaper to import and export from countries, much easier, and as a consequence, you get far more specialization. Uh, a lot of productivity gains in these supply chains simply because you can produce any little part in the most optimal location. Uh, de facto, it means I mean, look, these 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 supply chains are still regional. But de facto, it means that, 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 that there is a lot more trade and the trade intensity of GDP also rapidly increased. Until, and here's the global financial crisis. And since the global financial crisis, this share of global value chain in the global trade has no longer increased. A couple of reasons for that. One is, well, maybe, maybe the, and this goes only until 2015, that's because of the origin of the data, the TIVA data. Um, a because maybe these productivity gains have been have been have been exploited a little, already a little bit, and therefore there's nothing much to gain anymore. Uh, B uh, after the global financial crisis, the demand shifted towards a different kind of demand. There was a more more government driven demand, more more uh, less less on investment, more on uh, 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 consumption, which is less global value chain intensive. There's a couple of, of, of explanations for it. And in more recent years, people also started talking about the impact, of course, of the trade war, to which I'll come in a moment. Now, clearly, this is, again, the, this is the percent of world GDP. This is not the percent of world trade, percent of world GDP. And this is normal trade, call it sort of goods produced within one country and then exported. And this is global value chain trade, i.e. produced in multiple countries. And if you look at who drove that, this is from 1990, if you look at who drove that, the European Union and Asia. This is Asia. And of course, so, so big drivers of the global value chain trade are Europe and Asia. And if you look at uh, it, you see that China has a very central role in these value chain. This is 1995. This is the, the lines between those countries show basically the intensity of trade. And, and China was really in the mid 90s, was a bit of a backwater supply to Korea and Japan, but was not really not a very big player in, uh, in, the, in, in, in the world, in, in, in trade and in global value chain jump to 2016, again, the most recent data that, that, that the World Bank has, and you see China being absolutely central to global value change, right there in the middle of the whole web of trade relationship. Yes, the US is still a node, and, and Germany is still the big node in the, in the EU, uh, but China is a very big node, really globally. The global, the global link, linkages are very strong, and of course, the, the regional linkages are even stronger. Uh, this is uh, one, one illustration of that point is this, and it's uh, uh, done by Bloomberg, a very nice chart that looks at how much of a country's intermediate imports, i.e. goods that they use to put into other good parts, basically, that they put into other goods and then export, and how much of that is coming to China. And you see here in Asia, you see you know, almost 40% for Cambodia and Vietnam, similarly for Japan, similarly for Korea, uh, and, and very high percentages across the region, but even the United States in, in the 30% the 30 
range, much less so, much less so strikingly in Europe. So, but China, very important for global, an, an input provider into the global value chain and, and a, uh, uh, especially, especially in East Asia. Uh, and in East Asia here, you see that in terms of percent of GDP, this is the same imports of intermediates uh, is the blue. Uh, you see that for a country such as Vietnam, it is really very, very significant. It's, uh, the total imports from China is 25% of GDP, but 15 percentage point is intermediates that Vietnam uses to produce other stuff. Similar for uh, my, my country of, of, of uh, 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 residents, Singapore, uh, Malaysia. So China being a very, very important player in these regional supply chains. So thus, what I said in the beginning, thus the fear. The, the fear was, uh, how, how is this COVID going to, uh, how is this COVID going to affect the, 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 the supply chain? Well, basically, that is off the table. China's up and running again. It supplies, it supplies now, and it can, and it, uh, it can supply as much as it wants uh, of these intermediates. And the constraints has become the demand. But there's something else going on. And the origin of that is the US recurrent, I would say, eternal deficits on the trade account. China, uh, the United States has been running a trade deficit since 1973. And as an economist, you would say that is a fantastic achievement and the US should congratulate itself. That's not how the US sees it. Most of that deficit, this is the percent of total US trade deficit produced in Asia. Most of that trade deficit throughout history, at least since we have numbers, has been produced in Asia. And the beginning it was Japan, and then it was Korea, uh, and, and the rest of Asia, the NICs. But increasingly it has become China, especially after 2000, WTO entry, and China is becoming the final station of assembly of Asian value chains for exports to China. Well, this was Chimerica. This was all good until basically Trump came. It's a complicated story. I don't have enough time. I have another lecture for this. Uh, but but uh, the consequence was the trade war. And the trade war meant that we had tariffs to trade. But the trade war means increasingly constraints on tech and technological exchange, constraints on people. Um, um, export restrictions, such as the ones we used to know in the time of, uh, time of uh, uh, the old Cold War, uh, restrictions on trade. Now, what does that mean in times of COVID? And it is, look, this is something that we don't know yet, but here's my attempt to try and disentangle, disentangle this. And I look at China's export growth 2018-2020 uh, uh, for the first, for the first four months for the first four months, and the, the composition of, of uh, exports to countries. Now, if you look at to the US, you clearly see in 2019, last year, already, if you want the trade war kicking in, the tariffs kicking in, a, a big diversion of trade, and we'll come to that, a big diversion of trade to other countries, notably Vietnam, notably Europe, that benefited from this. But a big drop, about 10 percentage point drop in China. Uh, from, from imports of the United States from China. More so, uh, uh, so for, of export from China to the United States, I should say. More so this year. So, uh, uh, but this year, the drop is also very large in the UK, the drop is large in Italy, and all those countries with demand issues. So if you say, well, what was trade war and what was COVID? I would say, looking at this, I would say, well, this is COVID. And this is trade war. So the percentage loss of exports to the United States uh, last year was trade war. For this year, it was COVID. COVID will move away. COVID at some point gets a resolution. So the, the negative of COVID will move away, but the negative of the trade war will not. Same looking at US imports, a bit of a similar picture. Total imports is down as, as uh, uh, everybody knows, but the imports from China is down the most. It's a 15% last year, almost 25% uh, in, in the first quarter. They only have numbers until 
until March, but other imports are down as well. And you see here basically the commodity effects uh, uh, all coming down. I'm wrapping up soon. Then there was this trade agreement that said to China, oh, you have to import more. Remember, it was just before COVID became in the news. And here we are, um, China's falling short. Understandable, because there is not enough imports. Even China is importing less. As a matter of fact, they're importing far less. Uh, the drop in imports is far less than the drop in exports. And, and they are unlikely to make that commitment. These are the commitment lines. This is where they are unlikely to make those commitments before the end of the year. So the prediction for me, if, if there is to be the next administration uh, with President Trump, uh, this issue will come back and it will, uh, it, will reinforce, it will reinforce the trade war between China and the US. It is a COVID effect because China's imports is down overall, but it will translate into a trade war effect down the road. I will stop here and uh, because I want to leave time for questions. Final word is about the, the, the shift in global value chains. Uh, yes, something is a little changing in global exports, a little bit in FDI, but compared to where we are, there is not yet an alternative to China. China is still by far the largest producer of manufacturing, by far the largest export of manufacturing. Uh, Vietnam, a lot of people talk about it, not big enough to worry about. Even Mexico, not big enough to be a substitute for China at this point in time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hoffman. Um, I'm very glad that we're YouTubing this because there's so much data in there to digest that I'm, <laughs> I look forward to doing it at my leisure. Um, it's a very rich presentation, thank you. Um, I would like to uh, start the Q&A session now and I encourage all of our participants to submit their questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screens. And I'd like to turn the first question over to Larry Diamond. Okay, uh, sorry, Glenn, that my video is not working apparently, but Bert, I echo uh, a hearty thanks for this uh, amazingly rich presentation. You uh, indicated that uh, Taiwan's economy is trending uh, quite downward, even though um, uh, it's been remarkable in its uh, management of the crisis. It's got one of the lowest death rates per million. And you uh, have implied, but didn't have the time to discuss specifically what some of the reasons might be in terms of disruption of its major international trade partners and uh, decline in tourism and so on and so forth. But could you say a little bit more about what's driving the sharp downturn in Taiwan's economy and how they might kind of strategize uh, their way out of it? Yeah, so, so and I think, I think in part what we see now is already, uh, if you want to spill over a little bit of what happened, started to happen before COVID, it was the tensions, it was the less interaction between uh, China and Taiwan, less tourism, less visitors, which in part spilled over into, into this year. Uh, second is that their major uh, export markets are, uh, are, are not China, they're the United States and, and, and Japan and, and, and others, and they are down, so they see, they see much less export. I think there's a, a third factor, but that is that is of less certainty. It's more speculative, but and I would need to look at the investment the investment numbers. But the, the the factor is that that in a way Taiwan could benefit from the tensions between the United States and and China, because there could be an alternative an alternative investment destination for for. Uh, countries that are looking at, that are looking at a place in Asia to invest in, and and you see some of that some of that drove the economy in the past couple of years. If the, the slide I basically skipped over, you see that there was a, 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 a manufacturing FDI was quite large in in Taiwan. Overall, manufacturing investment was quite high and growing quite rapidly in Taiwan. I think that's on hold. So a big factor of demand is this manufacturing investment that drove the economy in the past couple of years is now on hold. So you have, you have basically all cylinders having a bit of a problem. And it's, it, it's, it's not Taiwan related. It's not how Taiwan manages the economy, but they're all external factors of, of, of uh, 
Now, how is COVID going to work out? How is the trade work going to work out? Let's hold, let's hold back. I haven't looked at the consumption numbers, but the, 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 the numbers from, from China, and again, that's not so comparable, but, uh, but a, Asians are a little bit Asian overall. Uh, one of the issues we saw in China is that actually people started to save a lot more. And of course, if you save a lot more, then you consume less. And, and, and the same happens in the United States, by the way. So the uncertainty drives different saving behavior, which in the end leads to lower growth impetus. But those numbers I would have to, uh, I would have to look into more detail uh, to, to, to give you a definite answer. Just trying to give you some leads on where to look. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to pose a question, and that is, um, many people have predicted the uh, decline of globalization, as you pointed out in 2008, and even previously, in 1918 they did as well, or 1914, I'm sorry. Uh, I was wondering if you're seeing uh, any shift towards regionalization, um, particularly in light of the trade war, uh, and whether the growth of regional trading blocks might be one outcome of uh, not just COVID-19, but the larger geopolitical context. So, uh, well, it, 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 of course, the, the answer is uh, the future, but too early to tell. But, but let me give you a few um, hints. And that depends on, it really depends on how the trade war is going to work out. Uh, when it becomes a tech war or a cold war, however, what kind of war you, you, you're, you're anticipating. But the, the, the decline, if you want, the, 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 the leveling off of global value chain as a share of total trade was really a China effect in the sense that China was onshoring a lot of its input industries to China, not necessarily owned by China. I mean, there's a lot of foreign investors, and Foxconn is, is, is sort of the quintessential, so a, a, a Taiwanese investor and producer producing, you know, iPhones for, well, for the Chinese market, but also for the international market in China. Okay. And, and onshoring more and more of the whole supply chain for, for Apple phones to China. And, and the, famous, the famous, uh, uh, famous example of the, of the iPod was you know, only 2% was, was, value, was value added in China or something like that. Now, the, 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 latest, the latest iPhone is actually 25% domestic value added in inputs into, into the iPhone. So, and that means that it's simply a lot more suppliers onshore, but not necessarily Chinese. Now, that, that, that was, if you want, a choice for, for, for global value chain optimization. So once the opportunity was there, you saw that and it leveled off uh, the, the supply chains a little bit because you no longer produce the parts in Taiwan and Philippines, you just produce them in China. So that, 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 that exited global value chain. If ironically, if now, if the trade war turns out to say, well, a number of things you can no longer produce in China, say chips, you can no longer print chips in China because that's difficult, but you can do it outside. The trade war actually has an increasing effect in the share of global value chain because those chips would still in the end go to China after some, some process and, and they would still manufacture the, they would still manufacture the electronics, at least for a Chinese market. And mind you, most of the growth of production in China is for now for a Chinese market. The, the value added for the overseas market is still there, but it's only 14% of GDP. Only 14% of GDP. There's about 18% of GDP in exports, but only two thirds of that is value added, domestic value added. So it's, 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 the domestic market is becoming much, much, much more important. So, so the trade war might just end up saying there's a number of sensitive goods that move out of China. Then there is some supply chains that are for the Chinese market. They will stay in China. And then there's a third that is uh, uh, for production for the world market may no longer come from China. So how exactly that nets out on globalization remains, in my view, remains to be seen. But it's a, it's a very interesting dynamic. Uh, and it's not yet, not yet settled saying, oh, a trade war automatically leads to less globalization. Regionally, regionally I, th I think, you know, the, the biggest regional question is, so do we have to choose sides? 
and 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 what if the United States pushes more, especially on this technology? Do we at some point need to choose sides, and what are the implications for our value chain? And I think one can speculate, one can think, well, how far will, will the U.S. push? Uh, you can end up in a Cold War situation when there's hardly any interaction with China. I cannot imagine that, but but if you really want to, that you know, they will take 20 years to unwind, but that's where you can end up. I think there will be something of a compromise. Uh, and that means that regionally, some of this production that can no longer take place in China will indeed move to the region, and that may actually be beneficial for some countries. Do you think that the outcomes that you sketched out depend at all on the extent to which, uh, how soon an effective vaccine for COVID-19 is found? Uh, if this crisis drags on at some level of intensity for the next year or so without a vaccine, will the effects become more permanent? Will there be more unwinding? Well, I mean, pe people will adjust. People have adjusted, right? I mean, I mean, we're having now a conference that normally would take me three days of travel. Um, uh, now I now have a life, and it's becoming sort of normal. Uh, even even the building Guangxi in China, we can now do through Zoom or or some other means. You don't necessarily have to visit anymore. I can I can literally build new contacts because everybody's getting used to it. So part of part of it may never come back. Um, um, but but uh, uh, what 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 I know will not happen, or what I think is very interesting, is that three four months ago we were talking about, oh, we have to move away from China because China is so risky, and look, they now have this COVID epidemic, and uh, that's risky for the supply chain. So we have to find alternative supplies. Well, resilience is not a reason to move out of China. Four months ago, people were thinking about it. Now people are no longer thinking about. Resilience overall, the, over the overall global value chain might still be a consideration, but that does not vote against China. As a matter of fact, China would still be uh, uh, pretty up there in terms of resilience. So, so, um, but more broader, I mean, I, th I think, I think more because of the. I still believe that the the trade, the trade issues, the trade war issues, will dominate the COVID issues. There may be, of course, there will be effects. And the effects on travel will be will be quite long lasting, and they will create new ways of interacting. Uh, so, so that may be a very difficult sector for the for the future. Uh, but but uh, other things will 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 come back. And, uh, the trade war is more important than COVID. I wonder if this crisis, as they say, offers certain opportunities as well. Um, China has been talking for a number of years about internationalizing the renminbi, and we've been hearing more about digital currencies uh, in the last year or so, particularly um, tax authorities certainly like digital mm -hmm. currencies because it allows them to um, to monitor transactions and, and to have more of the economy on the books. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering if you could give us an insight into where China is on internationalization of the renminbi, but also on uh, rolling out digital currency and how you see both unfolding in the next few years. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, that's that, that's a very good question. Interesting enough, domestically, I mean, China just started this experiment, and it's it's funny because we know that it's started an experiment. We just don't quite know how it looks like. It it, it reminds me of my youth when um, I was friends with a very big car enthusiast who got very excited when he had these sort of covert pictures of new car models coming out in obscure journals. And that's a little bit where the, where the uh, China, where the China digital currency is right now. We've seen the app on a screen of, you know, the, the agricultural bank or something, but we don't quite know the features. But the idea of a digital currency um, uh, is, is in my view quite powerful. I think first domestically, it's important to regain some control over monetary policy, I think, and that was the key driver, in the, I think, for 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 the for the for the for the first generation of of digital currency, i.e., uh, having Alibaba basically run your digital your digital currencies is probably not the optimal way for a central bank. So, with with a central bank alternative, uh, with legal tender digital currency, I think it's it's. It stabilizes, if you want, the monetary base uh, and the control over the monetary base. The added benefit is that, depending on how you how you share the information of digital currency, indeed, that you can keep control over 
over uh, um, um, uh, illegitimate transactions. You can, you can basically eliminate them uh, uh, if you can find the information on the transactions somewhere. But internationally, it's really interesting. And I think internationally, over time, this may just be a game changer. I say may because it depends on a lot of regulatory issues that yet need to be settled. But the notion that you can actually settle in RMB uh, instantly, basically through your cell phone, is enormously powerful. Because right now, you can't. And the clearance and settlement process in RMB is far more complex than it is in dollar. And it has to do with the international payment system, it has to do also with time zones and all these complex issues that come together. But if you can do that in digital RMB, it has, it's a big up for the value for holding the RMB. But there's a second element, and, and, and again, that depends how that's going to work out. If you can use that digital RMB to invest digitally into the Chinese capital markets, things become interesting. And I think the most interesting part of the, of the, of the COVID crisis was that there was a massive outflow of capital from emerging markets. $90 billion in one month is a huge peak but not from China. As a matter of fact, China for the first time doesn't look like an emerging market anymore. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, the foreign investors quota has been abolished, so you can basically invest whatever you want in the capital markets. And uh, <clears throat> um, uh, the, the other is um, uh, that by now, China's capital market is, is the second largest in the world, especially the bonds market. And it's been quite stable. So China's becoming an alternative investment opportunity. And I think that in the end will be the most important factor. If you have basically free access, you can go in and out and invest in relatively good, good investable material in China. That's, and if you can do that then very easily from your shop, from your, from your handphone with, with, uh, with digital currency, that's a very powerful combination. And that will help the internationalization of the RMB, no doubt. Right. Um, I have a question about what extent the offshoring that's occurring uh, and the re recalibration of international value chains is being driven by Chinese firms that are investing in places like Vietnam and elsewhere uh, as they sort of scale the value chain and, and go to places with cheaper labor rates and cheaper factor rates. So that in some sense, this is simply China conquering uh, some of its neighbors uh, economically and playing a larger role in their economies. Uh, well, it's not just China. It, it's actually the, the ones that started to move first were foreign investors in China. So they saw that they needed a more differentiated, uh, more differentiated supply chain. They saw the cost pressures, they felt the cost pressures, and they started to move. And, and some was for political reasons. The Japanese moved first because there were political uh, uh, troubles in, the early, in the, uh, the early 2010s. And so the Chinese, uh, the, the Japanese turned, turned relatively negative on China and decided to look for other, for other destinations. ASEAN was a big uh, uh, beneficiary. More recently, the Koreans, um, but also the Taiwanese are now looking at, at different, also because of their product palette, they've been looking actively at other places to produce. Uh, Foxconn has opened up in India, has opened up in Indonesia. Uh, so, so you see big foreign investors moving. The Chinese, were, the Chinese companies were first nudged to the inland. It was the Western development strategy, <laughs> and and I, th I, I think I think people have now recognized that that is actually not going to work, uh, that, that it, and, and and that it's too expensive, logistically too difficult, and if and if others move, uh, if critical suppliers move or critical clients move, you have to sometimes move with them. So so now you see that the Chinese investors move, but they're not the first movers. So they 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 they're, of course they they're quite important and and. Uh, even though it's it's right now on on, on uh, uh, it's now only simmering, but the, the Belt and Road Initiative helped there. I.e., uh, uh, the Belt and Road is there um, among many things. It's one thing. It's built infrastructure in countries where Chinese companies would want to invest. Nothing different from from what Japan did in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, uh, but that's. The, the, Said it's a bit on hold at the moment, but that was a factor as well in Chinese companies moving overseas. So, but they were definitely not the first movers. Right. 
How do you read the emergence of parallel institutions, which are sometimes read as China's effort to um, create a system that uh, lies outside of American influence? Uh, for example, uh, the Chinese investment banks, Belt and Road Initiative. Do you see these um, as uh, China's attempt to create an alternative world order or simply to fill in some gaps as it works within the existing world order and adapts it more to its liking? Mm. That's interesting because when I, when I was still at the World Bank, I was actually very instrumental. Well, I think um, so I helped out on, on helping set up the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was a great, great joy. And I think it's a I think it's a great institution and it's, it's wonderful that China is sort of coming on stage uh, as, as taking the lead on a, on a truly international organization was the AIB because I think it's a very good, it's a very good organization, but I'm totally biased. Um, yeah, China, China, I think China wants to work. In this case, China saw a gap and that gap became very clear with the global financial crisis. I mean, I mean the, the history is very clear. There was a global financial crisis. There was the London G20, and everybody said, "Oh yes, we need to build more infrastructure, and 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 to build more infrastructure, we need to better capitalize the international international financial institution. They can then invest, and that will pull up everybody out of our out of out of the recession." That was the philosophy. And so China said, "Okay, where can we when can we sign the check?" There was no, but it, you know, because more capital from China meant that voting. The voting order would change, and that was difficult, and so that took a long time. And then, then China came up with a different idea. Said, "Oh well, okay, we, we understand this governance thing that can wait, but why don't we just make a big investment fund on the side of the World Bank? And exciting, and and that was voted down. And then they said, okay, well, we, we just want to build more, more infrastructure. We're going to do the AIB, and it happened to coincide." But it, I, I still see it as a coincidence that, that happened to coincide with, with uh, Xi's Belt and Road. Uh, but, but the way I see that, it was sort of, it was much more, much more coincidence and sort of, oh, this fits as well, uh, rather than a, a deep strategy to, to have this initiative, then build a bank. No, the, the bank and the infrastructure finance that had been going on for a long time. Having said that, uh, look, I, I, think, I think China primarily wants to engage with the existing new, uh, the existing world order. They're not interested in building an alternative world order. They've done very well with the existing world order. And, and in a way, they're in a way a conservative power. They don't like some aspects of the world order, especially not that those parts of the world order that, that will say something about domestic policies in countries. They've been very consistent about that. And for, 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 for a very long time. And that has to do with human rights, it has to do with, with, with other issues. And there they try to, they try to influence. Like any country, uh, uh, any large country, uh, uh, they, they like that their country is portrayed fairly or well by international organizations. And as, as a World Bank, I can say that, uh, as a former World Bank, I say that yes, yes, you know, I had a lot of talks on how to present China's, China's issues and, 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 and achievements. But um, so that's if you want discourse, discourse power. Um, but I don't, the, the prime objective is not to have an alternative organization. The prime objective is to adjust the existing, the existing world order to help benefit China. But also at the same time, I, I, I've always seen China as being relatively open to a dialogue on, on what needs to change to, 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 to fit in China better. Because there were, of course, issues. Issues in WTO, there are even issues. There's a reason why the, the reform in the World Bank and IMF don't go as rapidly as, as, as desired. And there's issues now that came up with the WHO. It's not always good if there is too much influence of one stakeholder within an international organization, because that might create biases which will deny the use of the system. I, 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 I have some particular points on, on the WHO. I, I think the portrayal in the US media or the US politics of what the WHO did wrong and how, to what extent China took an influence, I have my own particular opinions on. I think it is all a bit different from, from what is being presented, but, but irrespective. You, you, you want capable international organizations in critical areas that can do their job. I think WHO by and large meet that standard, but they, 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 also, they also dropped a few minor balls along the way. I want to thank you for a marvelously informative 
presentation. Uh, and it's just been very wide ranging, extremely rich. Thank you for joining us at what for you is an extremely early hour in the morning. Uh, I'd like to thank all of our attendees as well and uh, just point out that this concludes our programming for what at least in the Northern Hemisphere is the spring. And we invite you to join us when we resume in September with a full slate of programming. On behalf of the Hoover Institution and our project, thank you and be well.